So the Elasticsearch Platforms Group is a new group inside HGST. As Barbara alluded to, we are a company with a long history of uh, innovation. We invented the hard drive here in San Jose about three miles from here back in the 50s. Um, this is that same company. We got sold to Hitachi, we got sold to Western Digital, and now we're HGST. Elastic Storage Platforms launched this first product a month ago, almost a month ago. Um, so we'll take you guys downstairs at the end of this. We have a, uh, our show unit on the first floor. It's a little too heavy for the, the floors on the seventh floor of this building. <laughs> Um, but it is a fully integrated object storage solution. We'll talk about what's inside this box as I go through the presentation. Um, it's 4.7 petabytes in a single rack. It's optimized for archive workloads. So this is not a primary storage box. It's not, um, it's not something you're going to put VMware on. But this is something where you can store any amount of vast quantities of data on. Um, the economics of the box are at white box pricing or lower. So we are talking about a very dense, very inexpensive method of storing your data. Some really high level details here. Um, there are a bunch of our helium hard drives in here. So as you guys know, we are um, rapidly innovating again in the hard drive business. Some of us thought that those days were over. Um, you hear a lot of things about the disk drive is dead. It's not dead. We have lots of really interesting things coming down the path. The um, first thing is helium hard drives. So we take the helium, pump it into a hard drive, seal the chassis, removes the air, removes drag, gives us power and cooling advantages, particularly in large platforms like this. Um, we have other technologies coming down the, the line. In the next six months, we'll have a release of this that has SMR-based hard drives, so shingled magnetic recording which is uh, letting us ramp up the capacity of these hard drives to plus beyond eight terabytes to 10 and beyond. Um, inside this system, there are custom enclosures we've built specifically for HGST hard drives. So they are currently the densest disk enclosures in the industry with 98 drives. They're specifically designed for our next generation of SMR drives, so they are all soft mount enclosures. And we'll, I'll show you exactly how they work when we go downstairs. So instead of a rigid click in place, infrastructure, the hard drives float inside, a, uh, inside the chassis and then they've got sleds that float so the hard drives are basically buffered against <coughs> any kinds of vibration and noise. Um, on top of that we have HGST Object Store and this is a uh, new software. It's based on um, software that we purchased from Ampladata which I will get to in a minute. I thought it was the next slide. Um, Ampladata software provides the erasure coding and uh, the distributed failure domain that lets us scale to exabytes of capacity. So that's all in one system. So we are basically producing everything from the hard drives to the software in this system to offer a, a complete solution. Some of the reasons that Barbara talked about why we're going this direction. Um, we have customers we've talked to who have 30, 40, 60 petabytes of genomic data and those are stored on traditional scale out NAS today they're running into the limits of that scale out NAS. They can't put any more on those large file systems or the file systems slow down and to the point where they're not usable. So that's one, one reason we're looking at this. Um, some other interesting things here. Your typical enterprise storage has hot swap hard drives and uses mirroring for data protection. We're moving away from that model. This is a fail in place model where if you lose one of the hard drives, if you lose one of the enclosures in this system, it doesn't matter because your data is still available and durable. And we'll talk about what data durability means as opposed to kind of the traditional high availability systems that we talk about in the enterprise. Um, what else is on here? Yeah, object versus file and blocks. So going to an object system where there's not a, uh, a metadata tree that you have to keep track of and replicate means that you can scale larger than a traditional file system. So also about a month ago, we acquired Ampladata. They're based in Belgium. Um, they are one of the early erasure coding and uh, scale out object storage companies. Um, their software is going to be the basis for our Active Archive products going forward. Uh, we invested in them a year ago and then acquired them just uh, last month. And um, it's, there's some really smart guys there. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to bring them on board and start working with them closer. Um, we've been working with them since our initial investment in 2014. Uh, they are uh, key to what we're building. So we also, as part of the launch, 
um, hit some major trade shows. We hit the uh, NAB and the HIM shows. So I'll talk about our target markets and where we're headed with this. Um, but these are two of our larger target markets, that being healthcare, bioinformatics, and uh, media and entertainment, because those people have really, really big data storage problems. Um, we had some press conferences, won a Best of Show Award at NAB, which is kind of cool, especially for our first outing into that, uh, into that conference. Got some really interesting quotes. My favorite is this one that Barbara got from Hims over on the left-hand side. We deal with large amounts of data, perilously guarded and hopelessly stored. This is from the people who host your healthcare data. Does that give you any sort of confidence in your hospital system? We are hoping to help them with that problem because they have so much data in, in healthcare and bioinformatics that they literally don't know what they don't know about their data. And in some cases, their systems don't let them delete data. The systems were never designed for data to be removed. So even though their guidelines say you can remove data after a certain number of years, they don't because they are unable to, if they remove the data, the application will stop working, which is a really interesting way to think about it. Um, I like this one, 4.7 petabytes is a number that makes my life a lot simpler. Uh, it, from the media folks, they have gone from very quickly from standard video to high def to 2K to 4K and now 8K is coming. And that has meant a jump in sizes of productions every time they do a new production. So we went from, I think it was Avatar that was the first production that used over a petabyte of data. That was several years ago to now where uh, routinely companies like Framestore in the UK, they did the uh, Paddington movie. That took them seven petabytes of data to generate that movie. So every year their, uh, their data storage needs are going up and they don't want to throw away any of those assets, especially the rendered assets at the end because those are their intellectual property that they make lots of money on over a lifetime of that, of that media. And they might go back and make two or three sequels using the same render frames and the same, uh, the same textures and the same hair. They can't throw any of that away. They can't put it on tape because there's, there's just no time to get it off of tape. So they need faster access to it. And that's what we're helping them enable. So what do they do just now? Now it's, if they can keep it on their expensive NAS or their SAN, they do. If not, it goes off to tape. Um, and my favorite story about this is a couple of years ago at NAB, I was talking to a family-owned production company, and this is a typical story. They had just wrapped season four of a show and archived it off to tape, and, but based on past experience, he knows what's going to happen is season five will come around, the producer will come to him and say, we need seasons one through four to do a retrospective episode and now they have a three month effort to get it back off of tape. So for them, this is something that's really feasible because they can move it off to a, a cheap, dense archive system, but it's still accessible when they need it. So who are we aiming this at? Um, we talked a little bit about media and entertainment. Uh, archives and content sharing in the media are huge. Um, they wanna keep everything and have access to everything so that they can do new productions without, again, going back off the tape. Well, one quick question. Sure. Um, who makes the, um, does your software intelligently determine um, um, what data is going to be cold or what's warm or what's hot, or is it some, is it a determination made by the uh, owner? Of the That's data? a determination made by the owner of the data. Okay. So we, we, are, we are a really big bucket for them to put their data in, but they've got to determine at what point it goes into the bucket. Okay. The same is for the retention, or uh, you just say that uh, there is no retention? Uh, uh, yeah, as far as we're concerned, it's retained forever until someone tells us to delete it. Okay. So we're not, we're not playing in the ILM space because, again, once we talk about these three different verticals here, their, their use cases for that data are very different. Um, you know, the media folks will probably do a project, archive it off, they may come back and revisit it in six months or a year, your genomic data might sit on that archive for 10 years before a researcher decides to pull you up because you've got blue eyes and you were born in New Jersey between 1947 and 1967. Um, so their use cases are very different. Imaging repositories in healthcare, you may get a x-ray taken, um, your doctor diagnoses you with a broken arm, it gets archived off after a year, but you go back in three years complaining about some kind of upper rotator cuff pain and he goes back and pulls the x-ray out of archive and determines, oh, you did damage your rotator cuff. So it's, the use cases are, are very different. 
And then when we look at public cloud or private cloud, these guys would like to be able to offer S3-like services to their customers. You know, They may not be as big as Amazon, but there's a lot of public cloud companies out there that would like to offer those kind of services. Same with a private S3 cloud. If we talk about things like a private Dropbox inside your company or inside your university, that data is a lot more interchangeable. So there's things coming and going all the time. So we've got a, a number of different workloads that this could address depending on what the the customers are doing. Oop, come back. Uh, some other customers that we are talking to, so governments, video surveillance archives, um, national record archives. This is a really interesting one. Uh, we talked to a company in uh, the Netherlands that specializes in digital archiving and preservation, and they are currently digitizing the Nuremberg audio recordings from the Nuremberg trials. This is the Presto Center. Yeah. And so these were recorded on wax discs, but they were never broadcast, they were never heard. All of the items that you and I have heard from the Nuremberg trials were as a result of transcription, handwritten transcription. So the opportunity to hear all of those people for the first time is going to be really interesting. Um, and this is a huge problem in places like Europe where they've got thousand year old archives of fragile paper and other objects that would obviously like to be digitized and they need a place to store them. You can't really put them on tape if you want people to access them, so having some kind of online archive uh, of national treasures is really interesting. Um, finance and banking. This is not something we had initially thought about, but the high frequency trading guys, they save everything. They go back and mine that data on a regular basis to base future trades on. And so um, there are some really interesting use cases there. Also in finance, the banks save every document and image, and they don't, again, they are allowed to throw it away after a certain amount of time. They usually choose not to um, because they find that they end up going back to them. Um, high performance computing, archive tiers for HPC. So this is not a, a high performance storage system. We don't run Lustre on top of it or GPFS, but once your GPFS or Lustre job is finished, if you want to archive that data, you got to have somewhere for it to go. Today, a lot of the HPC folks send it to tape. If they, again, if they want to get it back and run jobs on it again, it's a lot faster if it's on spinning disk. You have also a cost comparison between uh, cost uh, on your system and uh, on uh, tape? We do, and we've, we're not quite at the cost of tape. Okay. It's pretty close, but it's not quite close. at the cost of tape. Oh. Yeah. So be, being the hard drive manufacturer means we can do things with the cost that are interesting. What's the, what's the life expectancy of a modern hard drive? Uh, so the MTBF on these helium drives is 2.5 million hours, which is actually up from our air-based drives. So the helium allows us to reduce drag inside, so there's less wear and tear on the spindles, less wear and tear on the heads. In human terms, so mm -hmm. if I buy a rack, how, like, is that storage for the next how many, how many years before I'm going to have to figure out what to do next with it? That's a really good question. Barbara, do you know? Okay, so the question was, how long does this data last for? Yes. So we're doing um, innovations on the drive level, and we're doing innovations on the entire infrastructure level. So is that the goal is that we can create a, a sense of perpetuity in, uh, on your data. That's the key thing. So that may mean that the actual individual drives themselves may fail in time, but the infrastructure as a whole will be a continuous infrastructure, just like you would expect with an Amazon Cloud or Google or anybody else. That's the goal for the overall infrastructure. We have unique advantage as 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 um, we mentioned, the inventor of the disk drive and the deep knowledge we have of disk drives allows us to be able to do things with disk drives that make the actual disk drives themselves more reliable than somebody who's just taking an off-the-shelf drive, for example. And so our view for the long term for this platform is that you, we will be providing you cloud-like services and cloud-like infrastructure. Um, so it's, don't think of this as your traditional array that has a three-year warranty that you extend to five. It's not like that at all. It is, truly is cloud infrastructure is what we're building as a company. Question on the, oh, sure. you, you fill the drives with helium. Yep. <clears throat> what happens when we run out of helium? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, but I think the drives are probably the least of our problems at that point. <laughs> since a lot of our infrastructure relies on helium. <laughs> Did it leak? We have, we have other hard drive technologies that are coming down the line that do not rely on helium as well. 
um, but this is one of the ways we are able to extend hard drive life and hard drive uh, capacity. Um, so I, I, I don't know if you all thought this, but I figured around the four terabyte hard drive size, we were probably at the upper limit of technology. And that's one of the reasons we are going to things like Helium because it lets us extend the life of that technology and push it into uh, you know, over 10 terabytes. So you know, on, on the hard drive roadmap for the manufacturers are different technologies that will let us presumably get away from a dwindling resource like Helium. <coughs>